April 21st, 2024. That's where we are. And I did some reading this week about what the experts 30 years ago said about where would we would be at right now. Um, we're not nearly as far along as they thought we would be. The experts, of course, are the futurists, which is a pretty good job, I guess, if you can get it, because nobody can tell that you're wrong till after, <laughs> afterwards. But they said that by 2024, uh, the most popular Christmas gift would be trips to space. But uh, I guarantee you it's still going to be Amazon gift cards. <laughs> They said that by now we would have landed on Pluto, and they said that by now we wouldn't be doing our dishes or our laundry, because robots would be doing it for us. Um, we're not as far along as they thought. They said that by now the average life expectancy would be 150 years old by 2024. Uh, frankly, I thought we'd be further along too, like I thought we'd be teleporting to church by now. Or whatever. But uh, here we are, April 21st, 2024. Here you are. Here I am. And honestly, if, if I was to tell the truth, I actually thought that I would be further along by 2024. I thought that I'd have a lot of things figured out that I'd, I don't have figured out yet. I thought by 2024, I would be a lot more disciplined and organized and less selfish. I thought that by 2024, like, I would have this father and husband thing figured out. I've been married 31 years. I thought I, I'll be at pro level by then. Um, a lot of days, junior high at best. <laughs> That's me. Not quite where I thought I'd be. I thought that things like pride and lust and greed would be so 2014. <laughs> but here they are. If you think about your life, where you're at, April 21st, 2024, how would you finish this statement? I thought by now. Where did you think you would be by now, like personally speaking? I was reminded of this because I saw a Facebook uh, post where the guy had asked this question of his Facebook followers. Uh, he, he was a Christian person and on a Christian forum, and this is what some of the answers were. I thought by now, I would have figured out my teenager. <laughs> I thought by now, my marriage wouldn't be so much work. I thought by now, someone would have put a ring on it. I thought by now, I'd be out of debt and have money in the bank. I thought by now, I'd have a six-pack. I thought by now, I would have gotten sober. I thought by now, I wouldn't still be watching porn. I thought by now my husband would have figured out it's his job to wash the dishes. I thought by now I wouldn't feel so betrayed or so angry. I thought by now my business would have taken off. If you ask yourself this question, um, which is a good question to ask, I think, there are a couple questions I'd invite you to consider as you answer it. One is, how did you get where you currently are right now? Like you thought you'd be somewhere else, but here you are, April 21st, 2024. How did you get where you are now? And then the second question is, how do you get from where you are here to where you want to be? Like how do you get there? And I want to suggest to you this morning that the answer to both of those questions is the same. And the answer is one decision at a time. This is how you got to be where you are. And that's how you will get to be where you want to be. Now, I know there's a lot of mitigating circumstances and a lot of things that came into your life and a lot of people that did a lot of things. You say, hey, I got here, Steve, but yeah, there was all these other people that did all of these things. Yes, I get that. But still, you decided how you respond to all those things, right? Um, because the truth is that life, as a philosopher once said, is the sum of all of our decisions. Your decisions decide your life. And the way that you do that is one decision at a time. So we've been talking about this idea of um, one, the, the beautiful number one and how we become a beautiful presence. Last week we talked about it being one person at a time, one step at a time. 
Today we're talking about one decision at a time. If you read the stories of Jesus, you'll see that this is how he changed the world. He made various choices along his time when he was on earth. One decision at a time shaped the world and shaped how he was in the world. And the scripture that I'd like us to consider this morning is from Galatians chapter 6. Probably one of the most um, uh, powerful scriptures uh, to me in the Bible. And uh, you're welcome to uh, open it on your screen or your device or in your text if you like. And uh, let me just read it for you and then we'll consider what it means when it comes to decision making. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. We each reap what we sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The principle here is what I call uh, the law of the harvest. Uh, it starts right at the start there. Do not perceive God cannot be mocked. A man, a person, each of us, we reap what we sow. And so I want to suggest to you this morning that every decision that we make is like a seed that gets planted into the ground. And the law of the harvest, or the law of sowing and reaping, is, is a law that God has placed in nature. Like you, it's it's, it's um, not something that's really up for debate. It's like the law of gravity. Um, nobody can really explain in all the details the law of gravity. Um, and gravity is going to be at work whether you can explain it or not. And it's either going to work in your favor or it's going to work against you. You may not agree with the law of gravity. That doesn't seem to matter to gravity. You go out to your car, if you're on your way out to your car uh, after service and you trip and you fall in the parking lot, just because you don't believe in gravity, just because you don't like gravity, does not mean that gravity will cease to exist. What goes up must come down. You with me? It can either work against you or it can work for you. In gravity's case, if you jump out of an airplane, the moment that you jump out of the airplane, the law of gravity is working against you. <laughs> You're going down. You can fight it, but it's not going to make much difference. You're still going to go down. But the moment that you open a parachute, what happens? The same law of gravity now starts working for you because the parachute leverages gravity, allowing gravity to catch you and then bring you slowly down in the middle of McMahon Stadium in front of the crowds. You can either fight it or leverage it. The same is true for the law of the harvest. Every decision we make is a seed that we plant into this world. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later, you may be able to go on to victories you've never dreamed of. An apparent trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or a railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. One decision at a time. You can leverage it for your life or against your life. One decision at a time, that's how a marriage falls apart. But it's also how marriage comes back together. One decision at a time is how you got out of shape. <laughs> it didn't feel like much of a decision. It was just a cheesecake and a cheeseburger and pizza and chips. Um, but one decision at a time is also how you get back into shape. It's how you get healthy. One decision at a time is how you got into debt. Right? One charge at a time, that's how you got there. But one decision at a time is how you get out. One decision at a time. That's how it works. And so the question I want to ask you today is, what kinds of seeds are you sowing with your decisions? God cannot be mocked. Each person reaps what they sow. You can't fool God. You could fool your parents, your teachers, your spouse, people in this room, but you can't fool God. God knows. 
And he knows that inside of this universe that we live in, the law of the harvest is at work right now. Let me put it a little clearer, maybe. Put it this way. The law of the harvest means you reap what you sow. So if you want corn, don't plant beans, right? Uh, if you want pear trees, don't plant apple seeds. If you want pear trees and you plant apple seeds, like you should not get upset and freak out and act like you got cheated when you get apples from apple seeds. What did you think was going to happen? Hosea chapter 10, verse 13 puts it this way. You planted wickedness and now you, you have reaped evil. So if you plant certain things, if you sow seeds with your decisions, for example, let's say you sow seeds of lust and pornography leads you there. You want a fulfilling, intimate relationship with your spouse today or a spouse that you may have one day, but if you sow seeds of lust, you're going to reap a harvest of dissatisfaction and frustration because of what you've been planting. Do you see? So if you sow seeds of greed or selfishness, then you're going to reap discontentment. If you sow seeds of laziness or passivity, you're going to reap disappointment and regret. If you sow seeds of anger or rage, you'll find out that you are reaping, fighting and arguing and constant discords in your relationships. Because what did you think would happen? Those are the seeds that you have been sowing. Uh, a few years ago, I was at the gym. It wasn't the last time I was at the gym, but it was a few years ago that I'm telling this story. Um, uh, it was a fitness plus in Brayside, which is in the south part of the city. And I was, I was on an elliptical machine doing what you do on elliptical machines, getting bored. Um, and the machine was looking at the windows that was facing the parking lot coming into fitness plus, into the gym. And so I'm looking out there as I'm doing my thing, and there's this guy that pulls into the parking lot. And he's clearly coming from work to work out. Like he's wearing his business clothes big guy in a little car. He's got his gym bag, and he gets out of his car, and I'm just watching this as I got nothing else to do, and so he starts walking to the gym, and then he stops halfway, and I'm watching it, and he turns around, and he looks back at his car, and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe he decided not today. <laughs> I know what that's like. Maybe he doesn't want to work out. I've done that before. He goes back to the car, though, and I'm still watching him, and he opens up the door, and he reaches in, and he gets something out of the car. Uh, you know what? And he's got something in his hand. You know what it is? It's a cup. And it's a blue cup. It's a big blue cup with a red spoon. You know what that is? It's a blizzard. Yeah, it's a big blizzard. <laughs> and this guy, who I immediately loved, he was now my favorite guy at the gym, he's walking into workout while he's got his massive blizzard and he's finishing it off from Dairy Queen, which is right around the corner. So you come in, you work out. I can just picture this guy. He's working out. He's not getting the results he wanted, and it's frustrating. And he's thinking to himself, what's wrong? What's wrong? Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. He wants to get in shape, but he also wants his blizzard. <laughs> what you sow matters. So a wife is frustrated in her marriage. She wants a harvest of intimacy and connection, but she's planting seeds of criticism and harshness, and the weeds are choking out what she really wants. She wants intimacy, but she, she wants her blizzard too. And you want to be a more joyful person. And uh, you want to be a person that is at peace and has relationships that are calm and satisfying. And yet you're sowing seeds of bitterness, and you're refusing to forgive somebody, and you're bringing up the pain from the past, and you're comparing yourself to others. You can't sow seeds of bitterness or jealousy and expect a harvest of joy and peace. If you want a harvest of joy and peace, then you have to sow seeds of gratitude and thanksgiving. Because you reap what you sow. And every decision is a seed that you're sowing. The other part about this law of harvest is that you reap more than you sow. Or to put it another way, you reap later and you reap greater. That's what happens when you plant seeds. So seeds don't just reproduce one for one. They multiply exponentially. So if you, if you plant a pea seed, a pea plant grows. And on that plant are pods of peas, which have dozens of peas inside of them. So a tiny acorn grows into a mighty oak, which produces 
thousands of acorns. A tiny choice seems small, but it can result in a massive harvest. Some of you know what this is like. Uh, 4,000 years ago, God promised Abram, Abraham and uh, Sarah that they would have a son. You remember the story? Years go by, no son. So Sarah decides to help God out. Remember this? She suggests to Abraham that he take her maid, Hagar, into his bed. Abraham agrees. Bad choice by them both. Hagar gives birth to a son named Ishmael. Later, Sarah also gives birth to a son named Isaac. Two brothers grow up. They don't like each other. In fact, they hate each other. But the choices that were made actually turn out they weren't just about two brothers, were they? Because today, there's two races of people. And Ishmael was the father of the Arab people. And Isaac is the forefather of the Israelite people. And the reason that millions of Jews and Arabs hate each other, in part, goes back to a bad choice made 4,000 years ago. You reap more than you sow. Maybe this is why that old saying seems to ring true. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Or to put it another way, you always pick more than you plant. So you might think today, well, it's just a little decision. It's not that big of a deal. Or maybe you're a teenager this morning and you're like saying to your parents, man, listen, this kind of music that I listen to doesn't make any difference at all. But listen, a seed always reaps more than it's been sowed. So you might sow just a little bit, but it reaps something a lot bigger. And again, it can work for us or against us because this morning, we're sitting here in this building, for example. We're gathering as a church family. We are enjoying the harvest. You're sitting on the harvest <laughs> of the sacrifice of faith that people who have come before us made. Right? And you're sitting here this morning, and the seeds that you plant, as you keep sowing them and as you are patient, will turn into a harvest. That's the rule of the harvest. So that's the why every decision matters. But I, I thought it wouldn't just be fair to say, okay, decisions are really, really important. You probably already knew that. But I want to also address quickly how to make decisions, how to plant seeds that result in a plentiful harvest. So whether uh, this morning you're, I don't know, if you're writing your will or you're uh, trying to figure out your vocation or your relationships are a struggle, wherever you are, you probably have some decision that you're trying to make. And I want to suggest some ways to do that, uh, to make one decision at a time. And, and all I want to do is just ask some questions. Uh, uh, several, uh, it's probably years ago now, I, I saw the title of a book that I thought looked really good, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. So I made a decision and I ordered it on Amazon. But it wasn't a great decision because I only, it ended up being just the study guide to the book, um, which I thought was, uh, you know, kind of a ripoff that I had clearly done something wrong. But the study guide kind of had like the, the one-page summary of the book, so then I didn't need to read the book. So I'm going to give you the one-page summary, uh, even shorter than one page, and uh, you can read the book if you like. It comes from a book by Andy Stanley called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And he suggests this that if you're going to make good decisions in life, that you have to ask good questions. So here are five questions, and I'll put them up, and then you, you might want to take a picture of it, ponder it later. I've used these uh, to make big decisions in my life and little decisions in my life, journal through them. So whatever decision you have, I want to suggest, here's a way to make a good one. Here's some planting guidelines for the seeds of decisions, okay? How do we do this? Well, the first thing he suggests is this, that you need to ask yourself the integrity question. As you're making a decision, are you being honest with yourself? Have you ever, like, uh, made a decision and not honest with yourself? Or is that just me? Um, he says this, that, that you make a commitment that you will not lie to yourself even though the truth may make you feel bad about yourself. This may be the best place to start with decisions. Am I really being honest with myself? Um, sometimes we need other people to help us discover that, don't we? A second question is the legacy question. When you make this decision, what kind of story do you want to tell with your life? 
So part of that could be deciding your vocation, or part of that might be deciding um, where you're going to work, or um, uh, who you're going to be with, or how you're going to handle uh, children or handle aging parents. What kind of story do you want to tell? Can you tell a story that you're proud to tell? One decision at a time. Third question is this one. It's the conscience question. Is there any tension that needs my attention? Exploring rather than ignoring your conscience. So if you have a, almost every decision that's been really tricky for me to make, uh, whether it's a, a church decision or um, something like that, there's, there's oftentimes some tension inside my mind. If I do this, if I do this, you know, can I look myself in the mirror if I do this? And, and the commitment here is that if you feel a tension around a decision, explore it rather than ignore it. Because if you're like me, you've made a lot of decisions, and then later on when the decision, you know, I'm not reaping what I thought I would, had sown, I'm like, oh, if I, had, if I had just listened to myself better, if I had just honored my conscience, that that's part of the way that uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. A couple more questions. Fourth one would be this one. Um, when you're coming to a decision, the maturity question is, what is the wise thing to do, and how do I know that? Well, I look at both the past, present, and the future. Like, I, I zoom out when I make this decision. That this decision is not just for this time in history. It's also for the people who will come after me. It's also for future generations. It's also for where I will be 30 years from now, if I have that long or 10 years from now, or later this afternoon. And then the last question that, that he suggests is the relationship question, which is what does love require in this situation, and how will I dis make this decision with not only my interests, but the interests of others in mind? And hopefully as you uh, walk through this, you see how Jesus has um, demonstrated each of these skills. So my suggestion uh, to you would be, if you want to, just take a picture of that, uh, buy the book if you want, but if you're going through uh, decisions in your life, and you're saying, how do I plant wisely? Um, I found, I've found um, as I have journaled, so some decisions even that I've made, uh, as, as we've made as a leadership for this church, um, I've actually sat down and, and for myself, journaled each of those questions and said, okay, is there a tension here that needs my attention? Um, what about, what about the future? How does this look? So I just want to offer that to you and suggest that that will help you um, make some decisions. And then the last thing I'd like to do this morning is actually um, do some seed planting together. So why do we make one decision at a time? It's because of the law of the harvest. How do we do it? I think we do it by asking good questions. And then finally, now what? And I want to ask you right here, April 21st, 2024, I want to ask you to plant some seeds, to make some decisions. And I'll suggest uh, three, of course. Um, but you may have other uh, seeds that you want to plant today. And I want to ask you to do this. I want to ask you if you would just, right now, right here, decide to spend 1% of your day connecting to Jesus. Now, what would 1% of the day, somebody who's good at math is going to tell me probably. Uh, I think it's about 14.4 minutes a day, if you're precise. I wonder if you would this week, each day, spend that long just abiding with Jesus. 1%. What kind of um, harvest do you think that you would reap if you did that for the rest of 2024? Jesus is the vine and we're the branch. Our job is to connect with him. One percent. I wonder if you'd be willing to do that. You say, what would that look like? That might look like opening your scripture, spending time in prayer. That might be taking a walk with Jesus. I'm not sure what that would look like for you. Um, just a little bit of your day. Just a beautiful one percent. Second invitation to plant a seed. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to do this. I wonder if you could invite one person in your life that's not here today to a church event before summer this year. It might be to a Sunday morning assembly. It might be to one of the many uh, weeknight things that we have going on. It might, be to the, it might be to spend some time in the cafe visiting with you. I wonder if you'd do that. 
Because somebody did that for you, right? And we're here reaping the harvest of that. So I wonder if there's somebody that you can think of that you would invite. Maybe just bring them to mind now. Statistically, 75%, this is in Canada, of people who are asked to come to a church event will come if they're asked by somebody that they know. Interesting, eh? Like, well, I've asked the, clearly the 25% is who I've been asking. But uh, th- there's a high percentage of people that will come if you invite them. And then the last invitation uh, to make a decision is this. With your one life, would you decide to follow Jesus? It, one of the uh, things that is different in 2024 than at any time in our history as people is that we are overwhelmed by decisions. Um, the, the result of uh, choice has led to, in our culture, something that is devastatingly uh, damaging mental illness in Canada, and that is decision fatigue. Because we make more decisions every day than most people in history ever had to make in their lifetime. Isn't that true? You just go try to buy blue jeans one day. Right? You, you, do, you, you do anything, you, anything that you want to shop for, multiple, multiple, because we, li- we live in a, a society that ha- is, has choice overwhelm. Why? Because our culture believed that unlimited choice would equal freedom. But the data doesn't support it. That the more choices that we have does not equal freedom, it actually creates tremendous anxiety. You ever had buyer's remorse? It's a very real thing. So, I want to suggest to you today that there are some decisions that you can make that will make a lot of other decisions for you. And if you could make one big decision and say, that's my decision, it would take care of a lot of other decisions. So I don't know what you're dealing with this morning. Some of you are very uh, worried or you're challenged by decisions um, when it comes to dating or marriage or money or children, or friendships, or your vocation. You've got all kinds of decisions. And some of us are overwhelmed by decisions. If we could just make one decision, it would give us tremendous freedom. And I'm suggesting this is the one decision. When you decide to follow Jesus, a whole bunch of other decisions will be made for you. Isn't that true? And some of us are going through tremendous decisions right now. We can't decide this, we can't decide this, and somebody needs to come along to us and say, listen, You've already made that decision because you follow Jesus. I saw you in the baptistry. You made that decision. You're struggling with what to do with your relationships. You're struggling what to do with your money. You already made that decision if you decided to follow Jesus. Isn't that true? The old way of saying this was um, uh, this is a a top button decision, right? I've done this a few times because usually by the time I get to church, um, I I put on my uh, dress shirt. Um, in the dark so I don't wake up my wife. And more than once, I have misguided my hands to put my top button into the third or fourth button, which feels good at the time, but by the time you get to the bottom, it's a complete mess. Do you see? you got to pay attention. you got to get the first one right, but as soon as you get that one right, the rest of them is just like easy. You don't have to worry about it. It's just like, oh, shirt's buttoned up, just like that. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. But deciding to follow Jesus is a determinative determinative decision. It means that if you're following Jesus, a bunch of the tensions that you're facing right now will actually disappear. And that's the power, I think, of coming together once a week where we decide, listen, I already made a decision. I've already decided how I'm going to treat my enemies. Because I'm following Jesus, I'll do what he says. I've already decided if I'm following Jesus, how I'm going to respond to somebody who hurts me. I've already decided how I'm going to handle my finances. I've already decided. Because all of those decisions that overwhelm us can all be decided if you put this button together first (laughs) and follow Jesus. And here's the thing. You don't just do it once. Right? I used to think that uh, becoming a Christian or following Jesus is like, okay, Lord, here's my life. It's worth $100. I'm going to lay it all down, 100 bucks. 
Turns out it's more like a dime a day. <laughs> it's, it's, it, 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 over and over again, I make this decision. So the invitation to you, friends, is to plant wisely with what we choose to do. And I have this image in my mind of years to come where in the future there will be a harvest in our city and in our country because of how this group of people sowed and planted with our decisions. What kind of harvest could we reap? 